the continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Marty and Eric for appearing tonight to help make that possible. Town Hall will be continuing to produce virtual content this season, though we will be taking a brief hiatus through the holidays. In that time, we encourage you to check out our past talks available in video or podcast form on our digital media library. To round out this year, our upcoming programs this week include a conversation between Lauren Coe and Emily Kim on the artistry of pastry design, and Johanna Garten speaking with Mark Gunlogson about Christine Boscoff's life and dive, drive to become one of the world's top female alphinists. Please join us for those programs or catch the replay of our annual Rogue's Christmas dramatic reading of A Christmas Carol. Look for that as you browse our calendar at townhallseattle.org. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large have been put under significant strain due to event cancellations and the ever-changing landscape. We hope you will consider extending your generosity to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation by clicking on the donate button at the bottom of your screen or becoming a member. Our partner booksellers have been hit by the negative effects of the pandemic as well and can use your support. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the book being presented tonight, please use the link on this, pa on this live stream page to purchase through Elliott Bay Books. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream via our YouTube page linked here in the chat. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Tonight's presentation will be about an hour, including Q&A. Our speakers will select from questions submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. We will also take questions submitted in the YouTube chat. We cannot guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Civic Series is supported by Real Networks Foundation, True Brown Foundation, KUOW, and Wincote Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. Martin J. Sherwin is University Professor of History at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. He is the author of A World Destroyed, Hiroshima and Its Legacies, which was the runner-up for the Pulitzer Prize in 1976. It has been in continuous print for 45 years. In 2006, his book, American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer, written with Kai Bird, won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and several other prizes. Eric Schlosser is an investigative journalist and author. He is the author of Fast Food Nation, The Dark Side of the All-American Meal, a New York Times bestseller published in 2001, and most recently, Command and Control, Nuclear Weapons, The Das Mouse Accident, and The Illusion of Safety, released in 2013. He is a former contributing editor at The Atlantic. Sherman's current book, Gambling with Armageddon, Nuclear Roulette from Hiroshima to the Cuban Missile Crisis, has received rave reviews in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker Magazine, and Cricket's Review, which selected it as one of the best nonfiction books of 2020. It is also the topic of this evening's talk. Please join me in welcoming Eric Schwasser and Martin Sherwin. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I just want to start out by saying how much of an honor and privilege it is to have this conversation, not only because Professor Sherwin is one of the great historians of post-war America and of the nuclear age, but also because he was my advisor my junior year in college. And uh, he got me enormously interested in the McCarthy era in that period, and it had a huge impact on my own work. So I'm really glad to be here. It's also uh, I think important to be talking about nuclear weapons in the Seattle area because perhaps the world's largest storage facility for active nuclear weapons is about a half hour uh, west of the city of Seattle at Kitsap and some of those nuclear weapons could use some new safety modifications. So they may be out of sight and out of mind but they're a half hour away from Seattle and I think we need to be thinking about them a lot more than we are right now. So Professor Sherwin, 
um, that first book of Marty. yours, yeah. which is Marty, that first book of yours on Hiroshima is a classic and it's now 45 years since it was published. And I'm wondering what made you interested in nuclear weapons and do you remember when Hiroshima and Nagasaki were destroyed? Do you have a childhood memory of that? Uh, I have a childhood memory of the end of the war, but let's see, how old was I? I have five. I was eight years old. Um, and I really don't have a childhood memory uh, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But um, uh, there were a whole bunch of interesting experiences I had that uh, I think led me to my interest in uh, writing about the history of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps the first one, ironically, I think, uh, was um, uh, a job I had between my freshman and sophomore year in college. I, always, I was born in Brooklyn. Uh, my parents didn't own a car. We had traveled almost not at all before I went to college. I was at Dartmouth and um, uh, I got the idea that I'd like to go out west and do something exciting, see the real America. <laughs> uh, and I was told that uh, if you were a geology major and you went to the chairman of the geology department uh, and declared a major, uh, he might help you get a job out west. So I did that. Uh, and I think he gave me about 12 names and addresses of companies out west. I got two, re I wrote to all of them. I got two responses. One was no thank you. And one was from a very nice man at the Utah Construction Company in Denver, Colorado, mm. uh, who wrote, if you're in the area, stop by and we'll see what we can do for you. So I called my parents and told them I had a job <laughs> and I was going straight from uh, the end of the semester at Dartmouth, uh, I had a ride to Denver with some, an upperclassman and uh, they dropped me off. I walked into uh, the office of the Utah Construction Company at um, about three o'clock on a Friday afternoon, asked for this particular person. I was pointed out where he was and uh, I went up, introduced myself, and he said, who are you? And I showed him the letter, and that, that's me. And you have never seen somebody's jaw drop a foot and a half <laughs> onto a desk. <laughs> he never thought he was going to see me. But they were very nice, and he said, uh, come around on Monday, and you can do some work around the office. And Jack Bailey from the Lucky Mac Uranium Mine in Riverton, Wyoming, will be here on Thursday. He'll interview you. If he wants to hire you, fine. If not, I can't do anything more. Make a long story short, he hired me. And I spent the summer of 1956 at the Lucky Mac uranium mine, about 100 miles outside of Riverton, Wyoming. That was my And when you left that office, they must have been laughing that they'd given you that job and you took it. <laughs> right. I mean, was there any sense that working in a uranium mine might be a hazardous, hazardous, hazardous kind of thing to do? Uh, no, because it was open pit mining. Mm. Uh, you know, so you were just outside and um, I, uh, uh, I think I survived that. Mm. Uh, the next uh, event, nuclear event in my life, was a lecture in 1959 that I went to by none other than uh, Henry Kissinger, who had just published uh, Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy. And um, uh, Kissinger has a lot of faults, but one of them is not that he's not a good lecturer. Hmm. And I got very interested in the issue. And um, uh, 
my roommate, who was a lot smarter than me at the time, told me I was crazy to believe anything that Kissinger wrote in Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, where he advocated the use of tactical nuclear weapons. On the battlefield. Now, uh, yes, and I, um, uh, the, you know, make them usable, in other words. And I got very much into the debate with my roommate and uh, learned pretty quickly that uh, he was right and I was wrong hmm. and Kissinger was wrong, who a couple of years later came to the same conclusion because when he wrote his next book, The Necessity of Choice, uh, he took back the idea that using tactical nuclear weapons was a good idea. Well, his whole argument was that you could use those nuclear weapons on the battlefield and there would be gentlemen's agreements that you couldn't hit cities, you could only hit soldiers, and that right. you could negotiate a solution to a nuclear war. And to me, it was just one more manifestation of the total madness of yeah. that period that, you know, you think that like like the British of the empire, that of course we won't hit one another's cities. It was just it right. was crazy. Right. Well, it's just a, a, a perfect metaphor for the bizarre nature of how nuclear weapons are dealt with. You know, theoretically, all these things are possible. But in fact, uh, if the bell goes off and nuclear weapons are used, uh, we're all going to be destroyed. Yeah. And that's a realization that became very important in the story in Gambling with Armageddon. Well, and let's go back to the original sin. Let's go back to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, 75th anniversary this year, I think one of the most important events in the history of mankind and yet it's remarkable how little attention it now receives. I mean, when I was a kid growing up in the 70s and 80s, everybody knew about nuclear weapons. Everyone talked about nuclear weapons. It seems to be a subject that's been put behind us. But I'm curious now, 45 years after you wrote the book on Hiroshima, what do you think about Truman's decision? I mean, Truman has been attacked for years as a mass murderer. And it's interesting to me that, you know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt authorized the firebombing of Japanese cities that killed over a million people. And that's very rarely discussed. And yet the destruction of these two cities um, has become such a moral quandary. What is it that's different about the destruction of those two cities? What is it about nuclear weapons? And, and what do you think about his decision, you know, 75 years later? Um, a lot of questions in there. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, what, what we're really talking about is targeting civilians for mass murder. Yeah. Well, you know, Gabriel Coco wrote a book, um, uh, The Politics of War, uh, way back when. Uh, and he said that in 1963, I mean, in 1943, uh, the decision was made to bomb nuclear, uh, to bomb uh, civilian targets, to bomb cities. And that was the Rubicon. And once that Rubicon was crossed, uh, nuclear weapon, the use of nuclear weapons followed naturally. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's the first point that has to be made, that uh, the using them was an extension of what we had been doing, yeah. uh, or, you know, all along. Uh, but when Truman became president, uh, Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, who was in charge of the nuclear project, uh, went to him on April 25th and gave him a memo. Uh, one of the most interesting memos, which I quote at length in Gambling with Armageddon, that uh, I think are, exists in American history, uh, certainly for the Cold War. And this memo said several things. One, it said we are about to produce a weapon that can destroy civilization. Uh, and another thing he said 
is that the United States, given our uh, advanced use, uh, advanced production of this weapon, uh, is morally responsible for any disaster that occurs to civilization caused by this weapon. Uh, and he was making the case to Truman that this is a very different kind of bomb than the fire bombs and the other bombs, not because it will do something different uh, at this point in 1945 when it's ready, but what it will cause to happen after the war. Uh, Stimson understood that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were firecrackers compared to what would be coming. And uh, uh, there was an interesting debate. And Truman for a while really paid attention to the argument that maybe it's not such a good idea to use the weapon. But eventually he came down on the side, promoted by uh, his Bill Barr, <laughs> who, was, who was James Burns, um, uh, who said, you got to use the weapon. We're going to show the Soviets uh, that um, they have, may have many more boots on the ground but we have a monopoly of this fantastic weapon. Yeah. And I think one of the revolutionary things about the weapon is it just made mass murder more efficient. Um, yes. You didn't need thousands of planes and tens of thousands of bombs. You just needed one plane and one bomb, and it became much more economical. Um, yes. In the early war plans of the United States, when the Cold War had began, we anticipated using 100 to 250 atomic bombs to destroy the Soviet Union. So that's in around 1949, 1950. And a decade later, the United States had over 30,000 nuclear weapons. How is it that the military went from thinking we could destroy the civilization of the Soviet Union with 100 relatively small atomic bombs to saying that we need 30,000. What was the mentality that led to that complete madness of um, nuclear stockpile? Yeah, well, you know, the first thing was um, more is better. Uh, the more bombs you have, the more planes you get, and the more pilots you have, and all of that. But um, uh, to back up a little bit, uh, let me provide a little uh, analysis of the difference between the Truman administration and the Eisenhower administration and how we got from hundreds of nuclear weapons to tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. Uh, Truman <clears throat> uh, recognized finally after Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, that this was a weapon that could destroy civilization. And it was not a weapon that made any sense to use again. Uh, and especially after the Soviets got their nuclear weapons in, uh, their first test was August, 1949. For Truman, nuclear weapons were a backstop. Uh, they were there he had no compunction about reminding the Soviets in times of tension that we had it as a monopoly first, and then we had more of them. Uh, but he was not about to use nuclear weapons first and foremost. Mm. Um, Eisenhower came into office in 1953 there were about 1,200 nuclear weapons in the American stockpile at that time. And Eisenhower put all his uh, money in the nuclear basket. He decided that uh, massive retaliation, a strategy of massive retaliation, and the promotion of nuclear weapons as a uh, 
first line of defense, as opposed to a backup, would be a cheaper way to guarantee American security, to uh, promote uh, American policy to the Soviets, to protect Europe. Uh, it just seemed like a silver bullet. Uh, this was great. You know, so we went from 1,200 nuclear weapons in 1953 to, get this, 22,000 uh, or 23,000 under Eisenhower. When he worried about the military-industrial complex in 1960 in his farewell address, he knew from whence he spoke. Uh, he had built that complex. Uh, and the nuclear arms race, as we understand it, as we live through it, uh, and uh, all the way through the end of the Cold War, uh, this was the blueprint that Eisenhower laid out. Yeah. So, hey, one, of the, one of the ironies, though, is that, uh, and I'm curious what you think about Eisenhower now, is that Supposedly, Eisenhower opposed the use of nuclear weapons against Japan, and he resisted the use of them, and he threatened them, but resisted the use of them in Korea, um, in Vietnam, uh, and against uh, China over, you know, Taiwan. Taiwan. And so, what, you know, looking Taiwan. back at the madness that he embraced, at the same time, there was, there was someone who was restrained. Looking back at Eisenhower, what are your feelings about him on this issue? Well, um, I think that Eisenhower has gotten something of a free ride in this, uh, uh, in American history when it comes to nuclear weapons. You know, yeah. I, I just focus on Eisenhower and nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, there's a lot more to the administration, yeah. you know, than just that. But, um, when you look at the documents, the, the memos from the National Security Council meetings, Eisenhower was the most uh, a enthusiastic advocate of using tactical nuclear weapons in Korea, for example. Hmm. Um, at, there's one meeting at the beginning and sometime in 1953, which I document in the book. I can't remember what it is now. But um, uh, he, this is before the Chinese had come to the table. And he's arguing for the use of nuclear weapons. And he says something like, um, well, you know, we could use them uh, and if they can get us to the waste of Korea and what he means in 38th parallel, yeah. then it's it's useful. And General Bradley says, there's no good target. You know, it makes no sense to use them. And there's an interesting, you know, debate between, between them. Well, you know, the Chinese came to the table, not because of Eisenhower's threat to use nuclear weapons, which he did do. He, he threatened the um, uh, uh, the Chinese and the North Koreans, but because Stalin died in March of 1953. So, um, uh, you know, we have that. Uh, then we have Eisenhower deploying nuclear weapons to Europe, to Turkey and to Japan and to uh, Italy uh, in response to Sputnik. It was always the nuclear silver bullet would solve the problem. Mm. And he didn't want a nuclear war. I'm not saying that. No. But what I'm saying is that it was so easy, you know, to reach for the nuclear solution uh, rather than the more complicated solutions, you know, related to uh, conventional weapons, diplomacy, you know, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So Eisenhower was, uh, you know, it, it's a very mixed bag. Mm -hmm. And know? before we before we leave Ike, I'm just curious about your thoughts right now about the, the echoes and the similarities between the McCarthy era, which is what I studied in, in college, and the last uh, four years under Donald Trump. I mean, this 
conspiratorial thinking, the anti-immigrant sentiment, the kind of enemies and enemies of the people and enemies lists. Did you ever think that that sort of mentality would return to America? And where does the analogy hold and, and where where is today a thousand times worse? Well, I think the analogy really holds. I mean, instead of communism uh, being everywhere, we have the dark state, whatever the heck yeah. that is, yeah. everywhere. And um, the kind of politics that Trump represents, you know, is a politics of conspiracy. They're, they're there. They're out to get you. In the dark of night, they're manipulating things. They're changing uh, voting machines. They're, um, uh, you know, they're, it, it's just one thing after another. And there are very clear parallels of behavior and attitudes between McCarthy's strategy and Trump's strategy. And the interesting connection, of course, is Roy Cohn. Yeah. who was, uh, you know, McCarthy, Joe McCarthy's um, uh, uh, manipulator. Uh, and he is the man who taught Donald Trump how to do what Donald Trump has done. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, the connections are, uh, you know, they're, they're all over the place. And, you know, one difference is that Senator Joe McCarthy did not have sole authority to use nuclear weapons, That's which right. uh, President Trump does at this moment, you know, five, 6,000 nuclear weapons. And if he wants to use them, the only thing that can prevent that is a act of mutiny by someone in our armed That's forces right. or right. national security staff. So, you know, and, and that, just sorry to interrupt, yeah. but you know, that just brings up, you know, a very important point about what sense does it make, especially today, when we have invulnerable submarines with uh, submarine-launched ballistic missiles that can reach any one of our enemies, to have a launch-on-warning situation for ICBMs in the United States, uh, and one man, I don't care if it's Donald Trump or anybody else, one man making a decision uh, that can be made in three minutes or 10 minutes uh, and launch nuclear weapons. It just makes no sense yeah. whatsoever. Yeah, and you know, the current estimates are that if there was a relatively small scale nuclear war between India and Pakistan involving a couple of hundred relatively less powerful nuclear weapons compared to ours, there would be a billion casualties worldwide. And when you look at the power of our nuclear arsenal and the fact that we have thousands, uh, the notion that any one person could kill multiple billions of people without any restraint is absolute madness, and yet there's so little discussion of it. It was the greatest subject uh, in the world that, that not only dominated the mind of policymakers, but dominated the minds of the great novelists, playwrights, artists. Everybody thought about nuclear weapons really from 1945 until 1991, 92, and there's just been this extraordinary um, historical amnesia that's descended on this country, which allows a small group of policymakers to do whatever they want. And um, that's what we're seeing. And that's why I think your book, which is not only based on half a century of your thinking about the subject, but also upon all these declassified documents that would never have been available when you wrote your first book on nuclear weapons is just so important and i feel like we should get to the cuban missile crisis and for people who haven't read the book give a sense of how the world was almost destroyed i mean literally uh civilization 
was almost destroyed in 1962. In, in my book on nuclear weapons accidents, I write about a number of close calls, but I think the Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest we've come to an all-out nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. And um, how did that happen? Well, it happened uh, over the course of 17 years. And that's why I uh, wrote the book From Hiroshima to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. Um, because many of the things we've already discussed sort of laid the groundwork and the blueprint for nuclear weapons being the easy way to solve a problem and also for those weapons to be uh, a counter to the other side's nu nuclear weapons. So uh, Eisenhower comes into office in 53. Khrushchev really takes over the Soviet Union around 55. Uh, and massive retaliation is the American policy and brinksmanship. And uh, Dulles is threatening uh, the Soviet Union with, uh, uh, with nuclear war if it crosses, you know, the red lines that the United States has drawn. Well, Khrushchev says, hmm, this is not a bad idea. I can do that too. Mm. And he tries it in the Suez crisis. Um, uh, he has letters written to the Israelis the French and the British who have invaded Egypt uh, to regain control of the Suez Canal. And the letter says, uh, essentially, if you don't pull your troops out of Egypt, uh, I may very well launch nuclear weapons against you. Um, that's the essence of what he's saying. And um, Lo and behold, they pull their weapons, I mean, they pull their troops out of Egypt over the course of X number of weeks. Well, Khrushchev says, whoa, this works very well. <laughs> uh, but it's another example of uh, bad uh, information or lack of information. Uh, the Israelis, the British, and the French didn't pull their troops out of Egypt because of uh, what Khrushchev threatened. It was because Eisenhower was so furious that they would do this behind his back and muck up his foreign policy that Eisenhower put the screws on his own allies, on the British and the French, uh, economically. And the British almost had a financial collapse hmm. and they had to pull troops out. So Khrushchev has, as I say, it's kind of like Chanticleer believing that when he crowed, he made the sun rise. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, Khrushchev crowed and the troops left. Yeah. It, it was, it was um, a, a total misreading, but it convinced Khrushchev this is the way I have to go. Hmm. Fast forward now to Sputnik, October 57, Eisenhower's reaction to that, a lot of panic in the United States. We're going to put nuclear weapons in Turkey, in Italy. We're going to give nuclear weapons to the, to the British, uh, intermediate range nuclear weapons. And Khrushchev looks at this and in 19, after the Bay of Pigs and says, how am I going to protect my new best friend, Fidel Castro? Mm. Um, well, I could put troops there. I could put tactical nuclear weapons. And, you know, the United States could probably overwhelm them anyway. Uh, but if I put intercontinental and medium range ballistic missiles into Cuba. The United States wouldn't dare attack Cuba because I might launch those weapons against the United States. And not only that, I would help close
the gap in terms of the American nuclear advantage. Uh, so, wow, this this is everything. I mean, you know, this is this is this is a you know a, a home run with bases loaded, and um, uh, so he just gets focused on this uh, uh, <laughs> nuclear solution to the problem, just like. Truman had the nuclear solution to Japan, Hiroshima, uh, to uh, threatening the Soviets. Uh, Eisenhower had the nuclear solution to all of those issues between 53 and 60. And now it's Khrushchev's turn. Hmm. Um, I mean, one of the really um, unsettling things about the story is you have this standoff between two nuclear states and the leadership the leaders of both states are doing everything they can to avoid a nuclear war and you almost get one anyway yes and, and i'm sorry no no go ahead and i was just going to ask how is it when john f kennedy and khrushchev both do not want a nuclear war that we almost got one that would have literally destroyed civilization and killed billions of people. Well, McGeorge Bundy once said to me, um, national security managers cannot manage everything. Crisis managers, crisis managers cannot imagine anything. And he was 100% right. The president has a response to the Soviets. The Soviets had a plan how to protect Castro. But it's not John Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev sitting in a room uh, resolving this problem. You have tens of thousands of troops out there. You have airplanes fly flying around. You have um, uh, missile crews, uh, you have anti-aircraft crews, you have ship's captains, you have submarine captains. Four sub Soviet submarines on the blockade line, all of them each armed with a nuclear torpedo. And American anti-submarine forces are trying to bring those Soviet submarines to the surface. They're dropping depth charges, uh, not to kill them, but to warn them to come to the surface. But the Soviets read it differently. This particular Soviet captain in submarine B-59, Savitsky, he says they're trying to kill us. Uh, we are not gonna be the disgrace of the Soviet Navy. We are gonna take them with us load the nuclear torpedo. Mm. And there are anywhere, according to how the story is told, it's told by different people, anywhere between one minute and three minutes or five minutes, where that nuclear torpedo was about to be fired. And there is by chance, by luck, a another Soviet naval officer, equal in rank to Captain Savitsky, uh, who is a much cooler head and who realizes as a result of a particular circumstance, which is too complicated to explain now, but it's in the book, uh, realizes that the Americans aren't trying to kill the submarine. They're trying to bring it to the surface. And he talks the captain out of firing that submarine. So it has nothing to do yeah. with Khrushchev and Kennedy's desire to avoid a war. There was luck involved in, in avoiding that war. That was the closest call, but yeah. it was not the only call. And what if that, what if that torpedo, that nuclear torpedo had been fired? What would the likely course of events have been after that? Uh, I think nobody can imagine that Kennedy would not have had to 
uh, respond in some nuclear fashion. Yeah. And, you know, during the crisis, um, uh, uh, the, the chances of those kinds of responses periodically, you know, were, were very real. So, for yeah. example, on the very first day of the crisis, October 16th, after Kennedy is informed that those missiles were discovered in Cuba uh, by a U-2 flying over Cuba on October 14th, um, he gathers together his advisors, called the XCOM, the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, and they have a meeting, and they all conclude, all of them, including the president, that we're going to have to bomb and invade Cuba. Uh, by luck, and luck is here again, Adlai Stevenson has a luncheon appointment with the president that was made weeks ago. After lunch, uh, Stevenson takes Adlai Stevenson, I mean, Kennedy takes Adlai Stevenson up to the family quarters. Stevenson is the American ambassador to the United Nations uh, and uh, shows him the photos and says, we're going to have to bomb or invade. And Stevenson, who has a very different view than Kennedy of dealing with the Russians, says, whoa, we don't have to bomb and invade. There is a diplomatic way out of this. And he goes on and he essentially describes the blueprint of what Kennedy eventually followed in getting out of the crisis diplomatically. Yeah. And we know the details because the next day, Stevenson wrote a memo summarizing their discussion, uh, which is at Princeton well, University. One of the things I was going to ask you, and we're, we're sadly running out of time because I could talk to you for many hours about these subjects, is what do you think of John F. Kennedy in retrospect? On the one hand, he was willing to resist after that conversation. His entire Joint Chiefs of Staff, most of his top advisors want to go to war. And they don't realize that there are tactical, there are, there are missiles that are ready to be used that would have started a nuclear war if we had bombed Cuba. So on the one hand, Kennedy had the fortitude to do what he wanted to do, despite all of his advisors, but he really didn't treat the one advisor who gave him good advice, Adley Stevenson, very well after this whole, during this whole thing. And so, and I don't want to give that away necessarily, but what, what is your analysis of Kennedy and the fact that we had him as president in this crisis? Well, I think under those circumstances, barring having Stevenson as president, uh, we were very lucky to have Kennedy as president. Mm. Why? Because whatever Kennedy's faults were in terms of um, the awful things he did uh, vis-a-vis Stevenson and other things, stabbing people in the back politically. Kennedy understood that a nuclear war was a disaster. Uh, he said, it is insane for two people sitting on opposite sides of the world to be able to destroy the world. You know, just two individuals. Um, he believed that nuclear weapons were uh, a burden for statesmanship and for diplomacy. But he was fundamentally a politician and nuclear weapons were in the 1960s, early 60s, throughout the Cold War, and certainly after Eisenhower set the pace, uh, were the coin of the realm. And he was not uh, adverse to using nuclear weapons politically. Yeah. But if he had listened to his civilian advisors and his military advisors, yeah. here's what would have happened. We would have invaded Cuba. Well, you know, Cuba's a small place and, you know, the 
Cuban army is not going to be able to stand up to the 90,000 American troops who are going to land uh, on the beaches of Cuba and parachute in. The CIA estimated that there were 10,000 Soviet troops there. What was the reality? The reality was there were 42,000 Soviet troops that Khrushchev had managed to sneak into Cuba. The United States would have had to, troops would have had to face four times the number of Soviet troops they had expected to face. Also, the Soviets had tactical nuclear weapons there. We did not know that. When the Marines and the Army and the paratroopers hit the beaches and were blown off the beach by tactical nuclear weapons, what would have happened? Your guess and everybody else who's listening's guess is as good as mine, but I'll bet we all would come to the same conclusion. Yeah, it would not have been good. Okay, my, final, good. my final question before I, I hand it over to other people who have questions is, so this year is significant because it's the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's also significant, even though most people don't know it, uh, that the United Nations has formally called for the abolition of nuclear weapons. The treaty to abolish nuclear weapons has been uh, endorsed by enough member states so that it now has the force of international law. How hopeful are you looking forward over the next 10 to 20 years that we will have a world in which nuclear weapons are never used in warfare well, I think and that they will be, and that they will be abolished uh, well that's two different things yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> i uh, i'm pessimistic about the ability of human beings to have so much reliance on an this kind of weapon and it's never being used. It's almost inconceivable. I mean, I can't put a timeline on it. I don't know if it's five years, 15 years, 30 years, whatever it is, they will be used if they are around. What do I think about abolition of nuclear weapons? I think it's in every human being's interest that they be abolished. I think the only way they can be abolished is for the United States to take the lead and be totally serious about it. Uh, and go back to Henry Stimson's memo to Harry Truman that we are responsible for any disaster to civilization that nuclear weapons cause. That sense of responsibility has to permeate our culture and our politics uh, and finally get us moving uh, towards a commitment to get rid of these weapons. I don't think we can get rid of them instantaneously, but through a process, it is possible. And there are an awful lot of people like George Shultz and William Perry, uh, very well informed, Sam Nunn, very well informed people uh, who believe that certainly with the end of the Cold War, nuclear weapons are more of a danger to America than they are a solution to any of our uh, foreign policy problems. And I think anyone who reads your book will come to that conclusion as well. Okay, first question. Uh, what perspectives do you have as to the risk of a nuclear exchange occurring between the United States and North Korea or with Iran due to miscalculations by one of the parties? Uh, this is from Martin. Um, <clears throat> Well, miscalculation is probably the most likely reason that nuclear, a nuclear exchange, a nuclear war 
the use of nuclear weapons, however you want to put it, uh, will occur. Uh, I don't think that uh, rational decision making uh, will begin with nuclear weapons. On the other hand, if India attacks Pakistan and Pakistan is losing big time, it is seriously possible that they will use nuclear weapons, maybe just tactical nuclear weapons to start with. Well, if Indian troops get killed with tactical nuclear weapons, the Indian government will respond with tactical nuclear weapons. And it's like an avalanche. The first rock gets kicked down the mountain and things begin to tumble. Hmm. So, you know, nobody can predict, you know, what's going to happen, but the possibilities are frightening. A hmm. uh, question for Barbara. Uh, the Nazis were brought to account at the Nuremberg trials. Why didn't any other country bring the United States to trial for Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the civilian bombings of mainland Japan? I'm aware that other countries have committed atrocities but what we did was beyond the pale. Well, there was an Indian judge during the Japanese war crime trials uh, who wrote a dissenting opinion saying nothing that the Japanese did was as uh, uh, illegal as the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, why wasn't the United States brought to trial? Uh, because we were on the winning side. Uh, you know, Robert, there's this um, documentary film uh, it's a, with Robert McNamara, the title of which I forget for the, at the moment, uh, in which McNamara says that uh, LeMay had said to him, General Curtis LeMay, uh, that if we had lost the war, we would be tried as war criminals, which is true. There's no question, I think, that we would have been tried as war criminals. You know, the only issue I have is that there's been nowhere near enough attention given to the, the Asian Holocaust and the real level of violence that the Japanese perpetuated on their neighbors, not just on Korea, but on China, where estimates of the death are 10 to 15 to 20 million. So it's, there was terrible behavior all around. Yes. Um, and, and, and that has not been admitted by the Japanese, right. by the way, which is one of the sources of real tension between Japan and China. Yeah. Okay, from Rachel, uh, you were already an expert on this topic. But what did you learn or what surprised you the most while you were researching and writing this book? How have more recently declassified documents and studies changed the conventional wisdom on nuclear history? Well, I learned a lot of things. Um, you know, I've been lecturing on this and teaching it for a long time. Uh, I, you know, but most of when you um, uh, develop a course, uh, it's based on the literature that's out there and exists. Uh, and of course, sometimes you dig uh, deeper, but that's usually when you're doing scholarship and writing articles and books. Uh, I found um, uh, uh, that my view of the Eisenhower administration was severely challenged by my deep dive into um, the behind the scenes uh, development of massive retaliation nuclear weapons policies. Uh, I had begun, I suppose, as a young professor believing what most people in America believed, that it was Dulles, John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, uh, who was manipulating the president 
and promoting all of the nuclear weapons. Well, when you get behind the scenes and you look at the memos, you find it was the other way around. You know, that's mm -hmm. number one. Uh, number two, um, uh, I was surprised at how fearful the Soviets were about American policy and how um, uh, to deal with this fear, they aped American policy. And by doing that and by their secrecy, uh, uh, giving the Air Force especially the opportunity to argue that we need more and more nuclear weapons because they have more and more nuclear weapons. You asked at the very beginning, Eric, you know, about how did we get from a few hundred nuclear weapons, which were good enough uh, to destroy Soviet industry, to 30,000 nuclear weapons. Uh, it, it was, you know, action, reaction, and the desire of the Air Force and the nuclear uh, uh, community, that community that believed in nuclear weapons, to have more and better nuclear weapons. That, and this was good politics in America, especially in the 1950s. But mm. it, it continued throughout the Cold War. Mm. I'm not sure I answered the total question. But no, I thought that was, I thought you really did, particularly okay. about how your view of the Eisenhower administration and, right. and Dulles's influence. I thought that, I think that's fascinating. Right. Uh, but also, ah, I, I know what, I, I knew there was something that I wanted to say that I hadn't. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis itself. I mean, Adlai Stevenson's role is absolutely essential to understanding John Kennedy's behavior. Yeah. Uh, and this idea that Bobby Kennedy was the great dove, you know, is totally bizarre. It just comes out of a memoir that Bobby Kennedy wrote as a campaign document that was going to be a campaign document in 1968. Yeah. Bobby Kennedy was a dove when his brother told him what to do and how to behave and to be a dove. When John was out of the room, uh, Bobby came up with the most bizarre ideas. Let's sink the main again. Let's get this over with, you know. What, what was pathetic for me is how they perpetuated this macho myth of standing up to the Soviets and all these kind of hagiographies came out about what a glorious hour it was. And not only was it a lie, but they tried to destroy the reputation of the one person who really was reasonable and rational and played a central role in avoiding the war. It, it just, that's when I was asking you about, you know, how you felt about Kennedy today. Okay, one last question, and then we're out of time. Uh, what, this is from Dennis, uh, what is our greatest nuclear danger today? Well, the great... Uh, if you're talking about worldwide, uh, I think the India-Pakistan situation is very dangerous. Uh, I'm not sure I can, you know, argue for a greatest. Uh, the um, uh, there's a great danger of uh, North Korea going off again in this bizarre behavior that was um, uh, characteristic during the early Trump years. Um, the the long-range great danger is nuclear proliferation. Uh, there are some 50 countries in the world, plus or minus, that could go nuclear within several years. Um, and they haven't because they've been much more sensible than the United States and the Soviet Union especially. Uh, and those countries that have gone nuclear, of course, have gone nuclear in reaction to their neighborhood uh, and the exigencies of the Cold War. 
I mean, China, uh, uh, and, and China has nuclear weapons, India gets nuclear weapons. Uh, North Korea, do you, you know, the North Korea thing is particularly interesting. Um, the, there's a chapter in uh, Gambling with Armageddon about uh, the Eisenhower administration putting nuclear weapons illegally into South Korea hmm. as a way of um, saving money, you know, pulling troops out. Hmm. Uh, there was a clear agreement at the end of the um, uh, 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 at the end of the war. Uh, there was never a peace treaty, but there was an agreement uh, that no new weapons would be uh, put into either South Korea or North Korea. And John, interestingly, John Forster Dulles argued for months against this. Hmm. Eisenhower was promoting it. Uh, finally, Dulles gave in. And, uh, but his argument was, it's illegal. We can't do this. We've agreed to it. <laughs> but, you know, listen, we violated the Geneva, uh, you know, agreements in 1950, made in 1954 in Vietnam. Uh, you know, we violated the agreements in uh, Korea with respect to nuclear weapons. Um, uh, got a lot to answer for. <laughs> Well, thank you. This has been an honor. <laughs> and uh, I've the, book, enjoyed it. the book and the subject could not be more important. Well, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for the great questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just want to come on and thank you both on behalf of Town Hall for presenting tonight. Um, it's always a terrifying topic, but um, really good for us to know everything we can about it. And um, thank you so much um, for, you know, your insights and for all your research, Dr. Um, Sherwin. That's really, really a lot. Um, I want to encourage everyone watching tonight to, if, you, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book, uh, Gambling with Armageddon, that you do that uh, via the link on the live stream page here. That's going to take you right over to our partner booksellers, Elliott Bay, so you can purchase from them. Um, and thank you all for watching. Um, and again, thank you both for presenting, and I hope you have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, too. Appreciate it. Uh -huh.